Well, good morning again. We are working our way through the Psalms of Ascent this summer, which is always a mouthful to say, but it is, uh, it's this unique little section of the Psalms, Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. These were songs that the people of Israel would sing and pray as they would make their way three times a year to Jerusalem, the elevated city of Jerusalem. It was, it was raised up on a mountain, and so they would go up. They would literally ascend to the, this city, and they would sing these songs and pray these songs on their pilgrimage three times a year. And uh, this is why we're calling this, this series Songs for the Sojourn, or Beats for the Streets, if you're into that. And uh, likewise, in the same way for, uh, for those of us who might uh, identify ourselves as people who follow Jesus, we need these songs as well because we too are seeking after the city of God and we too are on this pilgrimage towards him and we need these songs as well to fortify us and encourage us, strengthen us to, to keep going, keep taking this long journey. And what I love about this next psalm in this series is that Psalm 122 kind of reminds us of what the whole point of the journey is in the first place. Why we would go on this long pilgrimage is primarily, fundamentally, to worship. You see that in verse 1. It begins, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Here's this guy that was just told, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to church. And his response is, yes. Just eruption of enthusiasm. I was glad when they said, let's go to church. Which I don't know how that resonates with you. I don't know how that lands with you. That might sound really odd. That might sound really uh, a little over the top, a little extreme. I'm, I'm sure that was not everybody's experience this morning as you made your way here. I'm guessing for some of you, uh, as, as, you as, as some of you were you know, yelling at your kids to get in the car so we can get to church on time or you know, fighting with your spouse on the way over here or uh, some of you, I'm sure, are just rolling in and you're just tired and bored or a little skeptical, a little feeling a little out of place in this, in this space. And uh, some of you may be thinking, I'd just be rather watching Sports Center. Like verse one would have resonated a lot more with me if it said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to brunch. But uh, it's okay if you don't share this guy's enthusiasm uh, for worship. I still think this psalm has a lot to teach us and a lot to show us. And really, I want to show you, uh, it shows us two things about worship. What worship does and where worship leads. That if you're going to set your heart on worshiping the God of the Bible, what does that do and where does that lead you? So that's what I want to look at with you this morning. What worship does, where it leads. So first, what it does. And really from this passage, uh, uh, it does two things. It binds and it reminds it binds and it reminds. So first, it, it binds. It binds us together. Look at, uh, look at verse 3. It says, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. He's thinking about the actual city of Jerusalem and how it was literally compact, that there were just houses on top of each other. There was, not, you know, there was no empty space that wasn't being utilized, no awkward gaps in the walls or the windows. It was, it was compacted tightly together as a city. I mean, if you think about um, a piece of sushi, uh, you, know, the, 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 you make a little sushi roll by tightly compacting the seaweed around the fish and the rice so that it's all in there together. If, it's, if it were loosely held together and you try to pick it up, it falls it apart. It being compact is what unifies it together. And so this author of this psalm is looking at Jerusalem and he sees it as an architectural metaphor for what worship does to us. It binds us together like that. Look, look at how he goes on in verse 4. He says, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. We have all these various tribes. They're scattered all over the place. They, they have different backgrounds, different cultures, different dialects, and they're all coming together unified around the worship of God. They, they, there are all these individual pieces of rice, as it were, coming and be, being bound together to worship God, which I think is, that, that is something really unique about worshiping the God of the Bible. If you think about it, for the most part, for the most part, generally speaking, every other faith feels fairly restricted to a certain specific culture. If you think about, 
Islam. It, it, is, it is fairly, uh, for the most part, restricted within one type of culture, within one type of racial group. If you think about you know, Hinduism, it's the same way, kind of restricted within this one kind of culture, this one uh, racial group. I mean, even Scientology feels pretty bound to one particular type of culture, one type of socioeconomic class, but that is not true of Christianity. Christianity is, is massively multicultural, massively multiracial. It's, it's global. It, it, does not, uh, it does not fit into one particular cultural type. In fact, Mark Knoll, who is a uh, professor, he was a professor at Regent College, professor at Notre Dame, in his book, The New Shape of World Christianity, Here's what he says. He writes this, quote, This past Sunday, it is possible that more Christian believers attended church in China than in all of so-called Christian Europe. This past Sunday, more Anglicans attended church in each of Kenya, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda than did Anglicans in Britain and Canada and Episcopalians in the United States combined. This past Sunday, more Presbyterians were at church in Ghana than in Scotland, and more were in congregations of the United Presbyterian Churches of Southern Africa than in the United States. He goes on, this past Sunday, there were more members of Brazil's Pentecostal Assemblies of God at church than, than the combined total of the two largest U.S. Pentecostal denominations. Last little uh, detail here. He says, this past Sunday, more people attended the Uodo Full Gospel Church. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's one church in, in Korea. More people attended that one church than attended all the churches in significant American denominations like the Christian Reformed Church, the Evangelical Covenant Church, or the Presbyterian Church in America, which is us. He references us. He says, six to eight times as many people attend this one church as the total that worshiped in Canada as 10 largest churches combined. Now, that's a lot, but you kind of get his point. He's making this big point that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on in the kingdom outside of our little neck of the woods. But the point that I want you to see is that when you worship the God of the Bible, you are connected to this worldwide, multicultural, multiracial, global community. There's nothing else like that in, in, in the world. For better or for worse, when you worship the, worship the God of the Bible, you are, you are connected to right-wing conservative Christians in middle America, and you are connected to left-wing progressive Christians in the, on the West Coast. You are connected to uh, Nigerian Anglicans and Russian Pentecostals and Chinese Presbyterians. If, 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 if diversity is your thing, Christianity, Christianity has, has cornered the market. When you enter into worship of the God of the Bible, you are entering into a multiracial, multi-ethnic, global community. It binds you together with each other and with that global church. That's the first thing. It binds us together. But here's the second thing that worship does. It doesn't just bind us. It also reminds us. It reminds us of what is true. L look at how the end of verse 4 goes. He goes on to say, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. The point of worship at the end of the day is to give thanks. It is a response to who God is and what he has done, and that response is thank you. It, it, it is to get you in touch with reality because what we believe as Christians is that all of life is a gift, that at the center of the universe is a God of grace. Grace is therefore at the very center of the universe, and there's nothing else like that out there. For example, think about this. Gratitude, gra you can only have gratitude if you have someone to thank. Gratitude only exists if you're thankful to something or somebody for something. Uh, there is, there's all this talk these days about gratitude. There, uh, modern uh, psychologists and, and uh, cultural, cultural analysts are always, always saying the importance of cultivating gratitude for our well-being, for just our overall sense of, of happiness. Uh, I used to have this planner, like an actual like paper calendar, and it would encourage you at the beginning of every day to write out three things that you're thankful for. This was not a, this was not a Christian 
calendar planner. This was not a spiritual planner by any means. It was just incorporating psychological insight that gratitude is important. Here's what's fascinating. Uh, modern psychologists and, and, and all this emphasis on gratitude, all these scholars are basically just reiterating what the Bible has always said, that grace is at the center of the universe and therefore the only appropriate response is gratitude. But here's the question. How can you cultivate gratitude unless you have someone to be thankful to, someone to be thankful for? For example, maybe you know the name Dan Allender. Dan Allender is a, kind of a famous uh, speaker, writer, therapist, and I once, I think this was on his podcast years ago, I remember him telling the story of a time when he was in New Zealand on sabbatical. We didn't, we didn't allow the holidays to go to New Zealand for their sabbatical. But um, he was on sabbatical for, for, uh, for his work, and he was in New Zealand, and he's, he's looking at this mountain range, and he just describes it as it is just staggeringly beautiful, just like can't even look at it, it's so magnificent. And he's sitting there looking at this mountain range, and there's the stranger next to him that has, I guess, gone on this same hike and looking at the same view. And the stranger looks at him and says, it's beautiful, isn't it? And here's how Dan Allender responds. He says, it is awesome. It is beautiful. And do you have anyone to thank for what you see? And he looks at Dan Allender, and he goes, what? And Allender goes, when you see that range, when you see the beauty before you, we are both worshiping. We are both looking at that and going, we are small before this massive beauty before us. But worship is more than awe. Who are you grateful for, for what you are looking at? Do you have anyone that you thank for what you see? And the guy goes, are you religious? And Dan Allender goes on to say, I don't think anyone who is close to me would use that word, but I am a follower of Jesus. And when I look at this, I see his majesty and his glory, and he made it, and I am so thankful for what he has done. Who do you thank? And the guy says, I, I believe in no God, and so I have no one to thank. Now, that's a little aggressive <laughs> for, my ta for my taste, uh, but I do think it's an interesting point that he's making nonetheless. He's making this point that how can you experience gratitude unless you, unless you recognize that there is a gift giver? How can you cultivate gratitude unless you have someone to thank? So gratitude assumes that there's a gift giver, but gratitude also assumes that you've been given a benevolence, that, that, that you have received a kindness that is unprovoked, that, that is undeserved. And that's why you have this, this response of just appreciation and, and, and thankfulness. Uh, if Christian worship is fundamentally giving thanks, if that's what worship is, then that reminds us that at the center of the universe is a wildly generous God, a God that has literally given us everything every breath, every heartbeat, everything that we, that we own, everything that we've experienced, it's all a gift. Uh, think of it like this. Let's say that you go to work, and let's say at the end of two weeks, uh, your boss hands you your paycheck. And you look at the paycheck, and it's just kind of the normal amount, your wages, what you, what you earn for those two weeks. Do you ever respond with gratitude? Wow, oh my, oh, thank you for this. No. Getting your paycheck doesn't <laughs> provoke any kind of gratitude because you earned it. It's yours. You deserved it. If you do not believe that grace is at the center of the universe, then you believe that law is at the center of the universe. And what that means is, 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 is you believe that human beings and, and the, the way that reality is structured is it's structured around entitlement, that people get what they deserve, and I should get what I deserve. And therefore, in your heart of hearts, you think, well, if I am good and I do good, then I deserve good. I deserve good things to happen to me. But here's what's so sad about that way of living your life, is that when good things happen, when you experience good things, it doesn't provoke gratitude. It's just you getting your paycheck. Yeah, I deserve this. I'm, I'm a good person. Of course, it doesn't provoke gratitude. In fact, it only sets you up to complain when the good things don't happen to you. And you get angry and frustrated because you feel like you've done what you should be doing. Entitlement, a sense of entitlement never, ever provokes gratitude. It can't. It can only set you up to just be bitter and complain. And yet here are these people, these ancient Israelites, 
that are literally going on cross-country road trips, as it were, just to give thanks. Why? Because they understand that life, it's not about meriting. It's not about earning. It's not about report cards and performance reviews. It's not about achieving. It's about receiving. They understand that at the center of the universe is grace. In fact, all of these, these worship festivals, three times a year when they would go to Jerusalem, what they were doing is that they were celebrating how wildly generous God is. In fact, one of, one of the um, worship festivals was Passover, in which they're celebrating God's gracious, unprovoked liberating of his people from their bondage in Egypt. And then they would also have Pentecost, which at the time was, was their celebration of God's provision for the harvest. It was kind of like their version of Thanksgiving, their harvest day festival. And then they would have the Feast of, of Tabernacles, which is a way of celebrating God's generosity and providing for them as they traveled through the wilderness from Egypt to, uh, to the promised land. His provision, his generosity, his liberation, he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. That's what was at the heart of their worship. But here's what's so fascinating. They could have never anticipated in a thousand years how, just how generous this God would get. Because centuries later, this God gave himself. He gave his son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave he gave away his son so that his son could bear all the things that we deserved. He kind of took our entitlement mentality and said, okay, we're going to let Jesus bear the brunt of all the things that we deserve, and he's going to get obliterated on the cross so that I don't have to relate to you in any kind of sense of law entitlement way. I get to relate to you purely by grace. I don't need a reason to love you. I love you just because I love you. When you understand that the God of the Bible is a God of grace, that is what drives your whole life to now be worshipful gratitude. If it, it, what is the logic of your heart? I mean, it, honestly, ask yourself that question. Why am I at church right now? Why am I tuning into church online right now? If, if the logic in your heart is, I'll do the church thing, I'll go, I'll volunteer, I'll bring the chairs over like they asked me to, and now, God, I'm kind of expecting you to live up to your end of the deal here. I want you to answer my prayers. I want you to give me a, the good life now. I mean, make life kind of work out for me the way I want it to work out. If, if that is the logic of your heart, you're not relating to a God of grace. You're, you're relating to a vending machine. If you know the God of grace, then the only appropriate response is thank you. The only appropriate response is, is your, the whole theme of your life becomes worshipful gratitude. This is why St. Augustine said, a Christian should be an alleluia from head to foot. That's what worship does. It binds us together and it reminds us of what is true. Here's the second thing. Lastly, briefly, where does worship lead us? If that's what worship does, where, where does it lead us? And... and Simply put, where worship leads is it leads us out. It leads us out. The house of the Lord, the temple, was located in the city of Jerusalem. That's the city that the church was in. And if you look at verses 6 through 9, this whole ending chunk, you see this progression that worship in the church turns into concern for the city. Worship in the church turns into concern for the city. It's like worship begins in here in the church and then it busts out the, the door and kind of flows in through the streets. Look at it. Look at verse uh, 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. If you boil all that down, there's really three action items that he says here. The first thing he says in verse 6 is he says, pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. He's inviting us to, to pray for the, the well-being, the security of that city. And then the second thing in verse 8, he says, I will, I will say, peace be within you. That He doesn't just pray for peace, he speaks it. Peace is seasoned in his language, the way that he, he, he talks to people. And then in verse 9, number 3, Three, he doesn't just speak it, he seeks it. 
I will seek your good, actively pursuing the good of his city. Do you see that? The worship of God inevitably converts into concern for the city. So if Jerusalem is the city that the house of the Lord was in in Psalm 122, it's not a crazy jump to think, okay, Memphis is the city that happens to locate our church, Midtown. So what would the worship of God, where would that lead us here? Where would the worship of God lead us in Midtown Memphis? Well, just take those three action items and let's apply it to us and then we'll be done. The first thing is prayer, verse 6 and 7, to pray for the peace of Midtown. I mean, to be a worshiping community here, the, the reason we're in Midtown is, is, is not just because we needed uh, real estate. We just needed somewhere to worship and this was just a, happened to be a geographic spot. Uh, no, to be, to be a worshiping community here in this part of the city means that we, we, we are in Midtown for Midtown. We want to pray for, actively pray for this chunk of our city to thrive and to, and to be secure and to be safe and for people to come to experience the grace of God here. So if you, if you in any way kind of, you know, associate with our community as, as Redeemer, I, w- I want to invite you to join us in praying for this part of our city, to pray for Midtown to thrive, to pray for our neighbors and our friends here to come to know and experience the grace of God in Jesus. So that's the first thing, pray. Here's the second thing, speak. Verse 8, we want to speak words of peace, the way that we speak to each other and about each other, the way that we speak to our friends and our neighbors here. The, the, we want it to be seasoned with the grace that we believe is at the center of the universe. How do we speak about other churches in Midtown? How do we speak about other institutions that do things or may believe things that we might disagree with? Is our speech seasoned with peace, seasoned with grace, seasoned with the love and the truth that we believe is at the center of the universe? Pray. Speak, seek, last one, verse 9, seek the good of Midtown. You know, it's always been a part of Redeemer's DNA to, to, to think this way. We're, we're, we're not going to take the resources of the city in order to build a great church. We want to take the resources of the church in order to build a great city. That's just the logic of the Bible, that the Bible says God's people are his chosen instruments to bless the world. So we want to bless our community. And so what would it look like for you to self-consciously start thinking, how can I press myself deeper into this part of the community? How can I take my connections, my resources, my time, my skills, whatever, and press them into this part of Midtown to form friendships and to form relationships and to have this part of the city thrive and flourish? Pray, speak, seek. Final thought. I, I, I realized last week that we, we, the Howells have come up on our one-year anniversary of our time in Memphis. In fact, this Sunday is, is the, the, the first Sunday that I, that I uh, preached here a year ago, which is really crazy to think about. But I was thinking about when we first moved here how existentially strange it was not just because of COVID, which was weird enough, but, but when you move to a new city, you know, all of our friends, all of our, all of our connections was back in Knoxville, which is where we lived before. And, we, you know, we loved Knoxville, and it was just weird to feel like our heart is over there, but we're here now. We don't know anything about Memphis. We don't know these people. We don't know this city. I don't know what the Croc is. I don't know what Young Ave is. But, but over the course of that year, I, I started to notice... Um, something changing in me. I started to, to discover myself slowly uh, feeling proud about Memphis and feeling, and feeling proud to you know, live here and be a part of this. And so we'd have, we would have um, out-of-town friends come and visit us. And I was like, oh, I got I to gotta take it all. I got to take it all the sites. We got to go to Crosstown. You got to see Stacks. I got to show you the Lorraine Motel. Like, I got to show you all the stuff. Start getting excited about the food scene here and exploring and checking out all the different cool restaurants and uh, find myself cheering for the Grizz and find myself having a, a growing disdain for Nashville. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the point being, it was a joke. So you Nashville people can, you know, hold your tomatoes before you throw them at me. Um, but, you know, part of when you, when you start to 
sync your heart up to, to something, you start to care about what it cares about. You start to love what it loves and you hate what it hates, like Nashville. And so uh, in the same way, when you worship the God of the Bible, when you sink your heart up to a God of grace, you start to love what he loves. You start to, be care- you, you start to care about what he cares about. And what does he care about? He cares about justice. He cares about shalom. He cares about uh, having the poor being taken care of. He cares about having equitable systems and where the vulnerable in society aren't falling through the cracks. He cares about people coming to know him and know his love and know and experience his grace and learning how to walk in his ways. That's what he cares about. So I want you to see concern for our city it's not a departure from worship. It's, it is the fruit of our worship. It is the natural byproduct of worshiping a God of grace. So as we worship here, right here, right now, may our worship bind us to one another and bind us to the, to the global church. Uh, may it remind us that grace is at the center of the universe. And may it lead us out into deeper compassion and deeper concern for our city. Let me pray. Father, we do pray that you would give us an experience of your grace, that that would not just be something that we talk about, but that is something that we feel and experience in our bones so that our only response is to give thanks, to love others with the overflow of this love that you have so generously and gratuitously poured out on us. In this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.